upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name. above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you never failed and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine Spirit, lead me where my trust was without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet would ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet would ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet would ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. My soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. Good morning. Good to see you here today. It's especially nice to see Clarence with us today. So they let you out. <laughs> it's 
So I'm glad you can be with us. I'm glad for all of you who are joining us online as well. We're here to worship the Lord together, so let's ask his blessing on this time. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Father, we may feel weary today. We pray for your strengthening. Father, we pray that you'd be with us when we feel guilty, that you'd provide grace. Father, when we worry, that you would give us faith. Father, we come to you today because we know that without you, we are nothing. But in you, we can fulfill the purpose given to us by the creator of this universe, and that is an exalted position. We humble ourselves before you today, Father, and humbly ask that you would be here with us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. It's time for us to worship the Lord with song, and so I'd like to give you the opportunity, if you're able, to stand with us, and we're going to start off with what, what a beautiful name it is. wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold Veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. Praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever. Yours is a kingdom, yours is a glory, yours is a name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, 
the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. I've been thinking about these times, and, and we certainly are in a time of change, and there's a strange feeling to that. You know the feeling that you get when you're like high up on a cliff, and you may not be real close to the cliff, but it's still a weird feeling because you're thinking, this is not safe. It's not safe to be too close to this. It's like, like you can't trust the ground beneath you, that, that feeling that I've got to pay special attention. And I think in this time of change, there's that sense, there's so many things that change, what can we count on? Uh, but we're going we're gonna to sing about forever rain, the one thing we can count on is that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the same God who brought Abraham through all that he went through, the same God that took Moses and took his people out of slavery, the same God that restored Israel after the Babylonian captivity, the same God that raised Jesus from the dead is the same God that is king right now. So no matter what political changes there are, no matter what cultural changes, no matter what health changes there are in our life, we've got one definite constant that never changes, that God reigns forever. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace, when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death has lost to sing. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord, all creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here, in your presence I'm made whole. You are God, you are God, of all else I'm letting go. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough, nothing compares your embrace light of the world forever rain i'm running to your arms i'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough nothing compares to your embrace light of the world will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus and oh I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough. 
Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world, forever rain. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world, forever rain. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus, Jesus. voices to him. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, 
How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great. You may be seated. He is great. We have many prayer concerns. Uh, We're praying for Maria's granddaughter. We're praying for, uh, we have a new request for Patty's daughter. Uh, for family issues. Let's pray for her. And uh, Charles is asking for prayer for a relative who's having an operation tomorrow. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to come to you in prayer. We know, Father, that that would not even be an option without the cross. But because you sent your son and he willingly died for our sins, we can still have fellowship with you in spite of our sinfulness. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness and grace that poured out with the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are willing to take the penalty that should have been ours. Father, we know your justice is great. Your holiness is great. We know that your love is great as well. Father, we come to you and, and ask for prayer and, and watchful care for Charles's relative who is going to have surgery tomorrow. We pray that you'd guide the doctors and watch over them. May they do exactly the right thing in the surgery and may it go well. Father, we pray for all those who are having family problems. And Father, there's a lot of strife going on right now. There's, there's uh, news reports that show that there's more and more domestic violence and and relationship breakups and child abuse and other problems with people uh, sequestered together because of the pandemic. Father, we pray that you would bring peace to our households. Father, we pray that you'd be with Maria's granddaughter. Watch over her and her health and also, Lord, as she walks through life, may she walk your path. Father, we pray for more and more people to realize that your commands are for our good. They're not a burden. They're the best way to live. And Father, we look at our world today and we see sheep without a shepherd. People living on their own wisdom. And that just doesn't cut it, Father. We want to have your wisdom. Father, I pray today for those who are grieving. I pray for Willis and his family, for Paul's family and for Al's family. For many others, Father, that have had to say goodbye to loved ones. Today I say, uh, lift up a prayer for Mary Worthy, Father. She just went into a nursing home. Watch over her and protect her. Thank you, Father, that people can be more able to go to visit in hospitals and nursing homes. I pray that that will be done safely. Father, we pray for Gary today and for Bill. And we pray for Carla, who's just been in the hospital. We pray that you'll be with Kay as she recovers from her surgery. Father, I I want to lift up in prayer those who are dealing with cancer. Some of these are such uh, difficult cases. And Father, the the best hope and, and the greatest hope of all to dwarf all the others is your watchful care. So I pray you'd be with Sarah and bring healing and Italo and Susanna and Stephanie We pray for Hayden and Mark, for little Ava and for Beth. Father, I pray for Cynthia Lynch and for Lois. We pray for Rebecca, who has a bad case as well. 
Father, we pray for healing for our church members and others like Maria and Gracie and Diana. Be with Connie today. Uh, We pray for Eleanor. We pray, Lord, for relief from pain for Jacob and his mom and for Yvette. We pray for further recovery for Wendy, for Dwayne Graber, for Charlie and Shirley's friend Bev. Father, we pray that you'd watch over all these and bring healing. We pray for our culture, Father. We pray that uh, it seems like the numbers are going down for COVID. We just pray that they continue to go down. And Lord, that we can get back to, to work, get back to being with each other. Father, I pray not only would we get through this pandemic, but I pray, Father, that along with everything else that's changed, that there would be good things that come out of it that make us different than ever before. I really believe that as bad as the Depression was and as bad as the two world wars were, that in some ways people developed character in there that stood them in good stead the rest of their lives. I pray that that would happen for us, Father, that we would take all of our experiences and submit them to you, and you would use them to mold our character to be more like you want us to be, to be more like Jesus. Be with all those who are suffering and going through difficult times, Father. Bring peace and comfort and healing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been going through the book of Colossians, and we're in the last chapter of Colossians. And in this last chapter, just like most of Paul's letters, he has some uh, ending statements. And, And some of these are personal statements to different people in the church. Obviously, when he writes to somebody and says, this is what you should do, it's not a statement directly to us. But it may reflect principles that we can take and say, well, this is what God says to people. And maybe God might be saying the same thing to you today. So I'd like to go to Colossians 4, 2 through 18. And we're just going to read this last chapter all in one bunch. So you can read along with me in your copy of scriptures. Colossians 4, 2 through 18. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instruction about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke the doctor and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her home. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you also in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. It's interesting that Paul begins this section that is basically his final words to this church at Colossae with a statement about prayer. And so that's why I called this sermon The Power of Prayer and Proclamation. 
our words have power. And, and we talk about that when we go through the book of James because it's, it talks about how the tongue is such a powerful uh, uh, force. And there it's spoken of as a powerful force for evil. Although he does kind of get into the idea of we use our tongue to praise God as well as curse those who are made in his image. And he said, this should not be. And he talks about how, uh, you know, a well can't produce both fresh and salt water. Uh, so we need to be able to protect our tongue from doing bad things so that it is unsoiled to do the good things. And here we see he's emphasizing those good things. And so we're going to talk about the power of prayer and proclamation. What do our words mean to, to God, to us, and to the universe? I think, first of all, he's saying that prayer is a very important thing. Prayer should be more than a meaningless ritual. Prayer should be more than a meaningless ritual. Um, he said, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. He didn't just say, make sure you have, have a prayer before your meetings. Make sure you, you have a prayer before you have a meal. He says, devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful. This is an important thing that you need to put some effort into. You need to work at being devoted to prayer. And then he asked for prayer for himself as well. And pray for us too that God may open a door for your message. Uh, a few years ago, I was thinking about the work that I do with Italo. You know, he's running that orphanage down in Puerto Maldonado. And, and my job that I... I think I volunteered for it at one time or another. Somehow I ended up with this job that um, I collect all the money that the supporters of this orphanage send and I put it into the bank and then I send it down at regular intervals down to the orphanage. Um, so that's, that's my job. But I, I realized as I was reading scripture that uh, there is a, a supposed to be a reciprocity in every relationship that we have. And, and I think there's real spiritual wisdom in that that's you know sometimes you read the word of god and you, you find something and you think i never thought about it that way but that's true you know if, if you're in a relationship well all you're doing is doing something for somebody else that makes them a dependent and it kind of diminishes them in that relationship and i thought well what is the relationship that I have with him? What can he do for me? Uh, you know, can he send money to our church? That wouldn't make any sense um, because we're sending money down to him. And I thought, what is the relationship? And, and then I realized every time we talk about, you know, here's what we're doing, here's what we're doing, he says, I'm praying for you and your church and your family. And he got to the point where he started asking for prayer concerns. And I started giving them to him. And I started finding out that everything that I asked for, it happened. And so I thought, man, if I ever need anything, I'm just calling Italo and he can pray. And now I don't really agree with that because, you know, there is no intermediary between us and God. We have the right to go to God ourselves. But there's nothing wrong with asking somebody else to join us in our prayers. And that's what Paul is doing here. He says, and pray for me also. So he's asking for their prayers as if somehow from a huge distance in a time where the only communication that they can have is a letter that's carried personally from one person to another and probably only once or twice in your lifetime are you going to send a letter like that. Somehow those prayers from that distant church were important to Paul. Do we value prayer the way the Bible values prayer? I think we, we should. Notice also, he, down here, he says, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you. So it's not that Epaphras says, oh yeah, I say a prayer for you every once in a while. He is always wrestling in prayer with you. It's like he's working hard at this prayer thing. And he's praying what? that they would stand firm in the will of God, mature and fully assured. That's a great prayer, isn't it? If somebody prayed for me that way, I would think that's a wonderful prayer for me, that I would stand firm in the will of God, fully assured. You know, not, not worried, not wondering about, 
you know, am I doing the right thing? Is it going to be successful or whatever? But fully assured, one day I'm going to stand before God and it's going to be okay. And, um, it's a, and then he says, I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for Laodicea and Hierapolis. These are cities that are nearby. He's working hard for them. And, and you know, the only thing he can do for them is pray for them. So Paul characterizes prayer as work. Uh, so prayer is meaningful work. It, it's, it's something that you can do for someone. And, and remember when they set up the deacons in the church? Do you remember why? The apostles were helping out widows and, and things like that, and they said, we can't handle this, all these details. We can't work all this out. And so they said, let's set up deacons or servants, waiters, so that we can devote ourselves to, and you remember what the apostles were devoting themselves to? Prayer and the ministry of the word. They saw it as part of their big job to spend time in prayer. And we should as well. One of the persons that's it's changed this world uh, just drastically it was Martin Luther. And he, he did so much to reform the church. And he was the one who said that he prayed an hour every morning. And sometimes when he was too busy and didn't think he could get everything done in the, in the day and, and there was just too much to do, he would spend two hours praying. Well, that sounds counterintuitive. Why do you spend more time praying if you have less time during the day? You know, you might want to say, well, this is a busy day. Maybe I'll only pray for half an hour and then get out. But he, he, he felt that the more time he spent praying, the better all these other things would work out. Have you ever had a day where you worked really, really hard and you got to the end of the day and you thought, I didn't accomplish anything? I've had days like that. I've had days like that recently. <laughs> um, we found out, by the way, if you call the, the church office and you hear, uh, it sounds like an old 300 baud modem, you know, that screeching sound, understand that we know that that's going on and we can't do anything about it. <laughs> I tried for three hours one morning and I couldn't do anything about it. They put in a new fire alarm system and didn't tell us that it was taking over our phone line. The old one used our phone line, but it didn't take it over. But they said, by code, it has to be dedicated. So now our church phone is a fire alarm phone. And so Tuesday, we have to decide what to do about that. But, but uh, spent the whole day, ended up, accomplished nothing. First, we had to figure out what was going on, and then we found out there was nothing we could do about it. There's times when you realize how little control you have over things. And then you realize how powerful prayer is compared to what you can accomplish. So maybe we ought to be thinking about prayer as the more important thing we do during the day. Uh, Oswald Chambers wrote, prayer is not a preparation for the work, it is work. Prayer is not a preparation for the battle, it is the battle. I think he had a biblical understanding of prayer. I think that is what is presented about prayer in the Bible. Think about how people prayed in the Bible. Think about the different people. And all the heroes of the Bible were people of prayer. I think about Hannah as she was childless. And, and they found her praying on the steps of the temple. And Eli, the high priest, thought that she was drunk. She was praying so earnestly. Um, and, and she had a child. And that child was the prophet Samuel. Think about Esther. When Esther was called to go to the king and intercede on behalf of the Jews who were marked for death. And her uncle said to her, or cousin, said, go to the king and ask for his rescinding of this order. And she said, you know, if I go to the king, there's an automatic death penalty, unless he forgives me. And Mordecai said, don't think if this happens that you're going to survive that you alone of all Israel will survive, but you and your family will be destroyed. And God's, message, God's deliverance will come from somebody else. But maybe you have been raised in this position for such a time as this. And you remember what Esther said? 
She said, I'm going to take my ladies with me. We're going to go off. We're going to pray. Have all the people of Israel fast and pray for three days, and we will do the same. And then I will go to the king. And if I die, I die. She realized how important it was to have that prayer, so she called for three days of fasting and praying. Nehemiah, when he heard about the sad condition of Israel during the captivity, he prayed for three months about Israel and what was happening. And then one day the king noticed he was sad and he said, what's wrong with you? And it says, Nehemiah prayed to the Lord. (laughs) He'd been praying for three months, but when the king said, what's wrong with you? He said an instant prayer right then. God, what am I supposed to say to the king? And then he pleaded on Israel's behalf. I think about Elijah who prophesied a son for the widow and she had a son and then he grew up into a, into a small child and then he died. And Elijah went to his room and he prayed, God, give life to this child. And God did. James encourages us to pray for the sick. And he said that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And then he gave, as an example, Elijah, how he prayed and for three years it didn't rain. And then he prayed again and it just poured. And he points out, Elijah was a man just like any of us. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think, oh, I'm just like Elijah. I have every relationship with God that Elijah did. I can pray to God and God will do things. He was a man just like us. And he prayed and this is what happened. So Elijah was a man of prayer. David's Psalms, many of them are, most of them are just prayers to God. Um, I think about Jacob when he was coming back to his family. And he heard that that his brother Esau, that he had cheated and then run away from years before, Esau was coming with 400 men. You know what Jacob did? He prayed. (laughs) He prayed because he was afraid that Esau was coming to kill him and all of his family. Think about when prayer was outlawed. And Daniel had had a habit of praying with the windows open, facing Jerusalem. And then they've passed a law saying, if you pray during this month to anyone except the king, then you're going to be thrown into the lion's den. You remember what he did? He prayed. (laughs) Because prayer, even if you risk capital punishment, is more powerful than not praying. And so he was a man of prayer as well. Uh, E.M. Bounds, chaplain during the Civil War, he said, prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Now, I I want to spend a a moment on that. How can that happen? And this is something that I wrestled with for a long time. If God knows the future, he already knows what he's going to do. If God already knows what's best for us, as Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount when he was talking about prayer, he said, God already knows what you need before you ask him. So you don't have to ask with meaningless words. If God already knows what we need, God already wants the best for us. God already knows what's going to happen in the future. Then how can prayer change anything? It seems like everything's set. It's all determined. There's there's no possibility of change. It's a deterministic world, it seems. And God doesn't change his mind, the Bible says. When we pray, we say, your will be done. So we're saying we want his will anyway. So how can my prayers change what the God of the universe is going to do? And here's the answer. I do believe that God always knows what's best. So if you have the same set of circumstances, God's always going to make that same choice. But when you pray, you've changed the circumstances because you've changed you. And I don't think that that just means that you are more accepting of what's going to happen. I think when you are a different person, meaning you have a different attitude, you have a different thought process, that changes what God can do in your life. You see, you are a creature with free will. God has granted that to you. And so there are things that can be to your detriment or things that can be to your blessing. And if you have a different attitude 
then that changes some things that are detriment or some things that are a blessing. As an illustration, think about this. Those of you who have children, I'm sure you taught your children to say please when they ask a question. Why did you do that? Is it just because, well, that's what your parents taught you? Is it just because you just love hearing please so much that, that you just want to force them into your pattern of what you like? Or did you think about it deeper than that and think, I want them to learn the character of someone who is thankful for what's done for them. You see, when my children say, please, can I do this? It's different than they say, hey, old man, do this for me. The please changes them from entitled to grateful. It's an acknowledgement that I don't have to do what I'm doing for them. I can say no. If they demand it, I feel like I have to say no just to prove it. But when they say please, they're acknowledging that I have a choice and that when I do it, I have chosen to bless them. The please takes the, the emphasis off of the gift onto the giver. Now, it, it's, I don't care about the fact that he says, please, that makes me look better or anything. But if I do something for my kids, I want our relationship to grow and be better when I do it. And so when they say, please, again, that changes it from just a gift to a symbolic act of love. And so we teach our children to say, please, because it, their character needs it. So when God says to us to pray for what we need, he's saying, I want your heart to be changed so that it's ready to receive what I'm going to give to it. So that when the answer comes, you're more likely to be grateful for that answer. When the answer comes, you're not going to just be entitled and, and think of yourself as independent because look at all the good things that have just flown my way because of my greatness. You'll be thinking, the God of the universe was willing to work on my behalf to do this. And it gives me a heart full of gratitude as well. God's will can change depending on your attitude because he wants the best for you. Prayer is a powerful thing. Prayer is so powerful that sometimes God will do for you less than what is best for you because of your prayer. Because sometimes you're not ready for the best. Here's an example of that. The people of Israel, they say, all the people around us, they have kings. Why can't we have a king? And, and God, I, I just imagine God up there saying, hello, what am I? Chopped liver? <laughs> you know, I'm sure God doesn't talk that way, but God was supposed to be their king. God was their king. And yet they're saying, we want a king, we want a king. It, God is a big God, but that is a hurtful thing for them to say. But finally, God said, you don't want a king because look at what your king's going to do. He's going to tax you. He's going to take your young men for his battles. He's going to take your women and children as servants. He's going to just do things for himself. You don't want an earthly king. You have the greatest king ever. Why would you want to set up a king? No, we want a king. God said, okay, you can have a king. Be careful what you pray for because sometimes God will give it to you. Now, in the long run, that really was what was best for them because they finally did see, hey, there's no earthly king that can compare with God. But God had to show them that because of their attitude. So I think it's always good to say, God, this is what I want, but your will be done. Because God, if I'm asking for something that I really want really badly right now, but in the long run it's going to hurt me or my loved ones, then I don't really want it. I'm willing to accept less than what I've asked for if you tell me it's more. So always ask for God's will in prayer. So what did Paul ask for them to pray for? He said, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. So pray for an open door and that I can 
declare it clearly. Uh, some translations, I think King James says boldly there. Um, so he's asking for prayer that he could proclaim it clearly, boldly, just state the message clearly so that they could understand it, and that he would have an open door for the message. Um, so a major prayer subject should be to clearly proclaim Jesus. Do we pray for that? I found that when we pray for opportunities to share our faith, the opportunities come. And I'm guilty of not praying for that the way I should. That should be our prayer every single day. God, God make me care about the lost the way you do. Give me a heart for what you have a heart for. And God, give me an opportunity to share my faith with others. Nowadays, it's getting harder to do things the old way. You know, tent revivals, most of the people I know would never come to a tent revival. Uh, they're not going to go to a big stadium. I, I mean, we've got the pandemic now, so it's kind of hard. Uh, I was talking to Daniel Ozalis this, this past week, and he's, he's been going through South America, doing revivals all over South America. He stopped doing it because there's just no way to do it in this atmosphere. Um, people don't really like you coming to their doors either. Uh, people have, most people have kind of gotten an, a bad attitude towards that as well. So what are our opportunities to share our faith? I believe when you ask for opportunities, God gives them to you. You don't have to make them up. You don't have to manufacture them. God gives you those opportunities. So let's pray that we would have open doors and that they would pro clearly proclaim Jesus. When I think about Paul saying, pray that I would boldly proclaim Jesus, I think, Paul, you're asking, what you're asking for, you already do. Have you ever read the stories of Paul? You know, he, he's in the Sanhedrin, and they, they're fighting over him, and he says, hey, I'm on trial because I believe in the resurrection from the dead. And they, they have a riot there. He's in Athens, and all these great philosophers are surrounding him saying, what's this thing that you're teaching? And he says, let me tell you about the unknown God. Well, the unknown God, he doesn't live in temples like this Parthenon you built. He's, he's the God of the universe. He made everything, and he, he's not served by human beings like your gods are. And then he said, he made all this clear through the man Jesus Christ, whom he proved by raising him from the dead. What a clear message. What a bold message. And some people rejected him outright, but other people said, we want to hear more about this. And I think, why would Paul pray that he would preach boldly when he's about the boldest one that I've ever heard of? And then I thought, well, maybe that's why. Maybe that's why he was so bold, because he had people praying for him that he would be bold. This prayer of proclaiming the mystery of Christ is an answer to the biggest problems of the world. This world needs Jesus. I, I feel like I grew up in a time where people were living on the memory of a Christian worldview. And, and people may not have accepted Jesus at that point. They, they may not have been Christians, but at least they felt like you ought to act like Christians traditionally act. That is over with. I think they finally woke up to the implications of their worldview and said, if there's no God, then there's no rules. And that's the kind of world we're living in. We're living in a world where more and more people are recognizing we've got to make up our own rules. Whatever floats your boat, right? I have a neighbor that they left their car outside and left the key fob in the car. Don't ever do that. They're regretting it now because in the middle of the night, somebody came and took their car, not because they wanted to sell it for parts or not because they're greedy, which you could kind of understand that's evil, but at least it's understandable. They just, they drove it. They drove a new car until the tires were bald. I guess they were doing burnouts all over the place. They drove it into a tree. Looks like it was on purpose. They totaled a new car. He's so upset about that because he's like, who would do something like that? Somebody who has said there's no rules and that they should do whatever they feel like doing at the moment. 
And too much of our world is like that today. Uh, you know, they have the, I think they call it the, the Turing test that says artificial intelligence will have achieved a milestone when you can talk with it on the computer for half an hour and not be able to tell whether it's human or artificial. They have achieved that. They, they're able to do that with artificial intelligence. They've gotten to that level. However, here's the problem. They actually put some bots on the internet where you could, anybody could type in and talk to them. And as it was talking to people, it learned the patterns of how people spoke and what they talked about. And it got to be more and more human-like. But they had to shut it down. You know why? It got so racist and sexist and nasty that they finally shut it off because it was learning from people it was talking to. Some people may have trolled it and just wanted to see what they could do with it, but I don't know that changes this illustration at all. People have problems. <laughs> there's evil out there and there's a lot of foolishness. No, never since in my lifetime have I understood that passage from Romans that says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Or as one pundit said, we have become nuclear giants and moral midgets. I think that's the kind of the message of our world today. This world needs Jesus. And how are we going to give Jesus to this world? Do we find some celebrity preacher that's going to just give the greatest message ever and we're going to have revival because of that? The trouble is our celebrity preachers, a lot of them have fallen into scandal. Even some of the ones I've respected the most. I've been so sad to see that they've been credibly and provably guilty of sexual harassment, unfaithfulness in their marriages. It, it, that's, we're not going to find some great celebrity that's going to solve all of this. So what's the solution? I think so, the solution is when God's people humble themselves and pray and ask for God for forgiveness and ask for God for revival. It's not up to us. It's not our timing. It's not in our power. We can be used by God and, and we should be open to that. But the answer is prayer. So let's proclaim the mystery of Christ. Let's pray that God would give us open doors. And let's pray that God would help us to speak it clearly when we have the opportunity. And then Paul says, let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. The world's conversations are not full of grace. The world's conversations, whether you're talking about on television, when you have people debating one another, whether you're talking about online, and whether you're talking about in person, often the world's conversations are full of offense. People, nowadays... Even, even um, comedians are saying, we can't practice our, our craft anymore because everything we say, somebody gets offended by it. Because that's the world we live in today. I recently saw that the Muppet Show has a disclaimer saying that there are racial and stereotypical uh, depictions in this show. If you are offended by the Muppet Show, I don't know if there's any hope anymore. I understand that, you know, we've got to be careful about people's feelings. And that's what we do as believers. I think that's part of our conversations be full of grace. We give grace to others, meaning that we are not prone to take offense. Everyone should be quick to listen, uh, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Let our conversations be full of grace. Uh, so the world's conversations are full of offense. Let's not try to give offense. Let's not try to be offensive. Let's try to be graceful towards others. And let's give them grace when they talk to us. That even when they say things that may be offensive to us, that we are willing to forgive it and overlook it in order to go deeper in that relationship. We are to have conversations full of grace. So much of our conversations are full of small talk, too. And, and I think there's a purpose to that. 
It's, it's good to talk about, hey, how about them Bucks winning the Super Bowl this year? That's, that's good to talk about. As long as that's not all you ever talk about. Let's go deeper than just the small talk. Um, find something to praise in the other person. When Paul saw a city full of idols, he spoke to the Athenians and he didn't say, you stupid idol worshipers. He said, I see you're very religious. You know, you're looking for something. Let me tell you about that unknown God that you're worshiping. He found something to praise even in a godless culture. He says we should have conversations that are full of grace, seasoned with salt. I like salt. Maybe sometimes I like it too much. We, we talk about salty language and we're talking about, you know, people using profanity and, and telling off-color stories and everything. The real salty language is language that preserves. He's saying, may your words be those things that bring life and sustain life. Seasoned with salt, full of grace. Isn't that really what we want to be? Is it that satisfying to beat other people down with our conversations so that we win the argument? There are times when I felt like I won an argument and I felt terrible afterwards because it's like I shouldn't have gotten that heated about it. That's not what we're called to. The Bible says that we shouldn't argue. Well, what about arguing for the faith? Well, the Bible talks about defending the faith, but it says the man of God should not argue. Meaning, if somebody's not ready to hear and talk about something, then maybe we don't even need to talk about it. We need to be fulfilling the, the ministry God has for us. I think one of the last comments that he makes here is he tells Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I think that's probably something he could say to any one of us. Complete the ministry God has given you. Every conversation you have can be used by God for his purpose in a big way or a small way. Doesn't matter whatever God's purpose is in that conversation. Let him give you the words to say. Spend time in prayer, bathing your life in prayer and say, God, give me the words to say that I would have conversations with others full of grace, seasoned with salt, clearly speaking about the mystery of Christ because that's the ministry he's given all of us. And this world needs Jesus. Thank you, Father, for this message. Thank you for this letter. Uh, Father, I wonder if Paul ever wondered why he was in jail. But maybe he needed to be to write the letters that are so precious to us. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit that's behind everything he wrote. I pray, Father, that we'll put this all into practice. Bring revival. May we see your power at work in our culture and in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Would you stand with me as we sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And if God's spoken to you or if you need prayer, the altar's open as we sing. You can come up and we can pray together. Let's, let's sing. Find a 
friend so faithful, who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laid? with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends for spies forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in He'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Thank you, Father, that we have a friend who sticks with us closer than a brother, a friend that will be with us forever. We pray, Father, that more and more people will find their faith in Jesus Christ, this friend who means so much. I pray now you dismiss us with your blessing. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with each and every one of us now and forevermore and until we meet again. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.